This is my surface grinder. I got it for Christmas last year, meaning I got it for myself around Christmas time last year. So far I'm really enjoying it, all except for the fact that I have to crank the table back and forth for an hour to actually grind anything. Add to that the fact that my left hand has to turn the crank in two directions, while my right hand turns the Z dial repeatedly in the same direction, and it's a real recipe for comedy, or if it's a part with more complex geometry, it's a recipe for a crash. Being an engineer and a big fan of Robin Renzetti, my solution to almost everything is to automate. So, automate we will. The machine has three axes, and I'm going to do my best to get the nomenclature right, though I'm not sure if that's going to lead to more or less controversy down in the comments. Let me know. The table traverses left and right. That's X. The head moves up and down. That's Y. And the table moves in and out. That's Z. That's different from what most people expect, but Z by convention is the axis parallel to the spindle. So on a vertical milling machine, it's up and down on a lathe it's left and right, and on a surface grinder it's in and out. For typical flat grinding, the x-axis needs to move left and right at a constant speed between two stop points while the z-axis increments its way across the workpiece. Then the head needs to come down for another pass. If that's the eventual goal, I'll need to automate all three axes, though my first priority is x since automating the table traverse will save me the most effort, and it's also the movement that my brain has the hardest time doing reliably. I'll also want to be able to traverse in the Z direction for cylindrical grinding and do things like move off the part for measuring and come back to the part for more grinding. And I'll need to be able to dress the wheel and come back to the part afterward. There are lots of details to figure out, but that's all software and we can worry about it later after we get the basics of controlling the machine sorted out. For the lathe electronic lead screw project, I used an exotic TI microcontroller and I built my own interface hardware to connect everything. That was lots of fun, but for this project, I want to try to use off-the-shelf hardware designed specifically for this kind of application. To that end, I'm planning to use ClearPath servos and the Technic ClearCore motion controller. If you've never seen the ClearCore, it's an ARM Cortex M4 processor in a package with ports to connect four ClearPath servos and a bunch of I.O. ports for 24 volt industrial sensors and actuators. So with this, no interface board should be needed. It can be programmed like an Arduino, but I'm planning to use the integrated development environment so I can use in-circuit debugging. For the user interface, I'm planning to use a touchscreen or maybe a couple of touchscreens. These programmable HMI units from 4D systems are inexpensive, at least for industrial hardware, and they make interface boards to connect them to the clear core. One of the advantages of having servos on all of the machine axes is that I can get a three axis DRO basically for free just by reading out the motor positions. So maybe I'll use one screen for the DRO display and another for setting up and controlling the machine. I don't know yet, but I have options. Now, I'm not sponsored by any of the companies that make these products. I would happily accept a Technic sponsorship, but they haven't offered so. I'm paying list price with real dollars just like everybody else. So I know I want to use clear path motors, but which ones? How big do they need to be? How much torque and how much speed do I need? Some questions like resolution are easy. Clear path motors come in a standard version with up to 800 steps per revolution or an enhanced version with more, of course, for more money. But for this machine, the standard 800 steps should be enough. Just from experience, I know a 3 to 1 reduction belt drive is practical, so I can just do the math. The z-axis moves 200 thou per revolution of the crank, divide that by 800 steps, and again by 3 for the belt reduction, and we get just over 80 millionths of an inch, or 2 microns per step. For y, it's finer, 20 millionths of an inch, or about half a micron, X doesn't have to be as precise, and that's good because it comes out to about two thousandths or 50 microns per step. I'm not going to be creep feeding on a grinder with a cable driven table, so that should be just fine. Torque is a little harder to figure out, but not too bad. Servo motors all have two torque specifications, peak and continuous. The peak torque is the amount of torque it can deliver for a short period of time to overcome stiction or accelerate a load and the continuous torque is what it can deliver, well, continuously. To measure the required torque, I just wrapped a cord around the wheel hub and pulled on it with a force gauge. 
If I know the force in newtons and the radius of the hub in meters, I can just multiply those together to get the required torque in newton meters. The Y and Z axes are screw driven so there isn't much stiction and I can just make sure the continuous torque of the motor is enough to move it. Uh, do remember to check both directions though. The torque to raise the head is greater than the torque to lower it. I divided the required torque by 3 for the 3 to 1 belt reduction I plan to use and then multiplied by a service factor of 2 to make sure I have lots of headroom and will get long service life from the motors and drive components. That's great for Y and Z, but the X axis is special for two reasons. First, it has a lot of inertia, so it requires higher peak torque when changing directions. And second, it has a lot of inertia, so we need to make sure there isn't a huge inertia mismatch between the motor and the load. To figure out the peak torque, I pulled hard on the force gauge to accelerate the table about as fast as I thought I might want to do in practice, took the peak reading from the force gauge, and did the math. Inertia mismatch, however, is harder to calculate. The moving load has inertia, and that inertia is reflected back through the drive to the motor. The motor itself also has a specified moment of inertia for the rotor, and the closer these two inertias match, the easier time the servo will have controlling the load. I spoke with Aaron, an applications engineer at Technic, who pointed this out to me. I had picked out a NEMA 23 motor that could deliver enough torque, but it had a very large inertia mismatch, so he suggested I step up to a NEMA 34. The larger motor has a smaller inertia mismatch, so there's less chance of the load oscillating. I did the math based on my best guess of how heavy the table and chuck are, and I think I'm around 10 to 1, which is acceptable, but in the end I'll put it together and see how it behaves. Clearpath motors come with a return policy, so it's pretty safe to guess and just see how it works. To figure out how to attach all the motors and electronics to the machine, I could spend all day with a tape, ruler, calipers, and a framing square trying to get all the measurements I need, or I could just spend all day with a 3D scanner making a model that I can import into my CAD software so I can spend more days playing around with all the options. So that's what I did. Scanning something this large can be kind of tricky. It's well within the capabilities of the Einstar scanner, but the scanner needs geometry or textures or markers to keep track of its position when moving over large blank areas or repetitive features on the machine. And if you lose tracking at any point during a large scan, you can't undo just the bad geometry, you have to start over. So for something like this, the best approach I've found is to use markers, scan overlapping portions of the machine as separate projects, and then combine them into a single model later. The other gotcha with this kind of scanner is that shiny or black areas don't scan very well unless you put something light and matte on them. Superfast Matt showed his recipe for an alcohol and baby powder spray. I've been using this scanner spray. It turns white to make it easy to scan and then sublimates directly into the air after a while so you don't even have to clean it off. It isn't cheap, but I'm still on my first can so it isn't that bad. This scanner can generate huge meshes, but I found that Fusion 360 on my computer behaves best if I can simplify them down to a million triangles. For a big machine like this, we may need more to have enough resolution to be useful though. Technic provides downloadable CAD models for all of their motors, so it's easy to plan out where things will need to be mounted and make sure everything's going to fit. I really want to keep the X and Z motors in between the horns of the saddle, and it looks like I'm just going to be able to make that work. I think I can use the screw holes on the front of the saddle to mount a bridge plate across the front for the motors and we should be golden. Once I have the motors about where I want them, I can measure the center to center distance between the motor and the input shaft and we can use that information to select belts and pulleys. The best tool I've found for designing belt drives is the center distance designer on the SDPSI website. This tool allows you to select your timing belt profile, drive ratio, and center distance and it calculates the pulleys and belts you need. You can play around with the pulley tooth count since 15 and 45 tooth pulleys give the same ratio as 24 and 72, but you do need to be a little careful because small pulleys and short center distances result in fewer teeth engaged and that lowers the torque handling ability of the drive. Gates publishes a document with charts and selection data to figure out what tooth profile, tooth pitch, belt width, and pulley sizes you need to transfer the amount of torque that's required. I ended up deciding on a 5mm pitch by 15mm wide GT2 belt for X and a 3mm pitch by 9mm wide GT2 for Y and Z. Those are based on the torque after multiplying by the service factor of 2, which is what Gates recommends. 
Once you're happy with what you see in the center distance designer, you can just click to see the parts you need to order and how many arms and legs it's going to cost. The pulleys and belts for all three axes came out to around $200 for this project. Could you do better by ordering cheap stuff on eBay? Yeah, but I opted to go with the name brand stuff because the torque requirements on the x-axis are pretty high, and this way I have actual specifications to work with. STPSI, of course, has downloadable files for all the parts they sell, so I can import those into my CAD model and make sure everything is going to fit the way I want before clicking the Buy button. There's always a lot of work that goes into a project like this long before it's time to actually make chips or write code. What you see here is the result of about two weeks of studying, mathing, and shopping. This isn't the sexy part of the project, but it's necessary. And now that it's done and the parts are on the way, I can get on with the next part of the project, which is fitting everything together and finding out what mistakes I made. All of that'll be in future videos, so subscribe to the channel to make sure you don't miss it. And if you want to support the channel, the best way to do that is through Patreon. Patrons can download files for all of my projects, including this one. And we just launched a discourse forum where you can connect with the community and get some behind the scenes access. Thank you for watching.